country. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our panel on the media and the story of diversity and inclusion. My name is Marissa Lang. I'm a reporter at the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, and I'm going to let my panelists introduce themselves before we get started. My name is Mona Lisa Ferris. I'm the president and founder of Diversity.com, and we publish six different diversity magazines from the Black Hebrew Journal, the Hispanic Network, Professional Women's Magazine, U.S. Veterans Magazine, Diversity in STEAM Magazine, and Diversability. So we basically cover the whole realm. I'm Megan Rose Dickey. I'm a reporter at TechCrunch. I cover diversity and inclusion, as well as the on-demand economy. Right on, and I'm Julianne Cromet uh, from Google. I'm the entertainment industry educator in chief, a job I made up. And we work, <laughs> <laughs> true, uh, we work across different media platforms from digital to traditional, looking at the narratives around computer science and engineering, and how can we make those more inclusive so more people actually see themselves in this profession, literally. Thank you. So I want to start broad and just pose this to all of you. Um, when we talk about the media, um, that covers a whole broad range of organizations and mediums. What is the role, as far as you see it, or what should be the role of media when we're talking about diversity and inclusion in technology and the tech industry? Uh, well, <laughs> Just jump in. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's, it's funny. I have, I don't consider myself to be the media. Like the media is some other thing that's like way bigger than than what I'm doing that's out there. Um, but in terms, I don't know. Do you, are we the media? I I think when people are you? say the media, they're talking about like the mainstream. I personally think cable news, usually. right? Like CNN, yeah. Fox News. But to some degree, there's this like it does feel like this otherworldly thing that we're talking about. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, but I'll just assume the role of the media right now. And <laughs> <laughs> for today, you're the media. For today, I'm the media. Yeah. So I mean, I think that we, we do have a big role in just shedding light on issues of diversity and inclusion in the tech industry. And even outside of the tech industry, um, I, I make it a priority to you know, cover companies' diversity reports and look into them and see if they're actually making progress or not, usually not, and then you know, ask, like, well, you know, why aren't you making any progress? And really just to keep them accountable. Mm -hmm. I think it's also based on like a reality check. I think when media can report and be honest as to what they're seeing, what they're reporting, and also giving back feedback to how to improve it. And I think in media, it's important that stories are relatable, that everybody can understand who and what the people are that we're talking about or the, the problems. Yeah, and I think, I mean, building on what you've both said is that it's critical in the sense that any research that's done around um, technical professions, computer science, has shown that perceptions of the career have really mattered, um, that the sort of loner hacker stereotype of the white guy who often sits in a closet and has no friends, um, usually with glasses, um, that this sort of, this image of a computer scientist has permeated for so long um, that we've seen it pop up time and time and again. Um, in Google's research around girls specifically, it was 30% of the decision, 30% was the perception of the career, basically. I mean, that's nuts. The only thing that was within one percentage point was adult encouragement, which is also driven by perception, right? So who can do something, who's capable of it? It's, it's those stereotypes that become coupled, right? And so I think media and sort of storytelling, however you want to encapsulate that, has a tremendous impact in how we sort of uncouple um, the sort of stereotypes and job, uh, you know, visions that we've put forward. Um, it, it's quite literal. I mean, I use the personal example of I'm Latina, and the first time that I saw somebody who looked like me on screen was Ugly Betty, was America Ferreira. And we haven't really seen somebody since until Jane the Virgin and Gina Rodriguez, which is 15 years later. And that's not even diving into specific jobs or the technical world, right? So this journey that we're sort of on in the larger scope of media and representation, I think, does a tremendous um, disservice, which can be the tremendous opportunity when it comes to tech, right, if we're going to deep dive into that particular profession. Great. So jumping off of that, um, I would pose this again to each of you. How do you decide what is newsworthy or what is story worthy? And who are you telling these stories for? Who's your audience? For example, at the Chronicle, 
I consider my audience to be a little more generalist than some of these tech industry publications because I still get handwritten letters from you know, 75 year olds in the East Bay who are reading the physical paper and they don't know what TechCrunch is. Mm -hmm. So um, who are you writing for and how do you choose what stories you're telling? Well, for my magazine, a lot of our um, readers are the Fortune 500 company uh, professionals that are either trying to recruit, they're the C-suite, they're the uh, people really there trying to make a difference. At the same time, you have a lot of students, diverse students. The whole audience is diverse, whether they're veterans, service-disabled veterans, people with disabilities. So all the information we report on is mainly all about diversity how to get a job, what to do, what not to do, whether you should be an entrepreneur, the, the value of being certified as a business, how to work with other corporations. So our audience is directly to that audience. Yeah, with, with me, I, I, f I feel that I, I'm trying to reach a, a couple of different audiences. So, you know, there's the more mainstream TechCrunch audience, which, you know, is your pretty like stereotypical tech person um, but then there are then there are the other people um, you know underrepresented minorities and women and LGBTQ people who are just who would just love to see themselves anyone like them like covered on TechCrunch or like to see that to see that TechCrunch is thinking about diverse people so um, I guess yeah, so I guess when I, when I write stories, I, I try to keep both of them in mind, but in terms of the people I'm trying to serve, it's, it's the underrepresented minorities, it's the, it's the women, it's the, it's the queer people, it's the trans people, it's all of them. Um, and, but granted, they make up a minority of TechCrunch's audience, so with, with a lot of the stories that I write, especially the ones that touch on um, transphobia or racism or sexism, a lot of the response is not great mm -hmm. <laughs> from, <laughs> from the broader TechCrunch audience. And, but at, at the end of the day, I, I think it's important that the people who get very upset and angry and don't want to hear about that stuff end up reading about it. So I just kind of love putting it in their face because they... I don't know, they, they can't really go anywhere. We kind of have them like locked into the TechCrunch brand and I'm like, okay, like here's all this diversity stuff, uh, deal with it. And uh, yeah, I mean, until, yeah. <laughs> can I, until I get fired, that? like that's what I'll be doing. Yeah. So in a, in a way, you're actually educating them at the yeah. same time and yeah. you're making your articles relatable, which is what I think media has to do. It has to, and from that, you, you end up educating them. I think that's exactly right. I was going to say, you meet people where they are, right? I, I think that's the only way we, we get this done um, and we bring everybody with us. So not just the people like us, a lot of us who might be in this room who already care about this issue for personal reasons, for reasons that, you know, of our career, where things have gone, but those who may not see inclusion as part of their own narrative and how do we involve them in the greater narrative? And a lot of that is, is reaching them where they are. I mean, our strategy is always... We're not going to reinvent the wheel. We're going to work with media partners who already have dedicated audiences, right, of all different ages. So, of course, we target girls, you know, between the ages of like 13 and 18, maybe even a little younger, black and Hispanic boys and girls in the U.S. who are severely underrepresented um, across all age spectrums. But then also parents and adults, because at the same time, like if the influencers in a kid's life are not on the same page, then suddenly that digital divide in the narrative part is also happening. Mm -hmm. And everybody is a part of that conversation. So, you know, we work with general audience shows, like we've worked with Silicon Valley, uh, worked with Halt and Catch Fire most recently. So, you know, it, it's really about meeting people where they are. You can't expect, you can't bring the horse to water. You know, you can't work from all the way back there. They have to be near the trough. And then it becomes an attractive part of the narrative they're already engaging in. I, I think that's the key, really. Sure, and, and so jumping off of that, you bring the horse to water, you put these stories in front of folks and you say, you know, here are some really amazing folks who maybe are totally off your radar, who you don't see every day, who you don't mm -hmm. know about. These are experiences you don't encounter. How then do you make stories of diversity and inclusion resonate or relevant to people who think that that doesn't affect them? Who maybe feel like, well, I don't, 
really know what to feel about diversity because I don't need to know what to feel about diversity. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it comes down to bringing in the, the human element and showing how it's really affecting people and, you know, like telling the personal stories of people's experiences with racism when trying to raise money or um, even in trying to get press coverage. I mean, there's just, um, there's way too many stories out there, um, just really sad stories that are out there of people being discriminated against. And the hope is that people will like find it in their heart to you know not be a terrible human <laughs> <laughs> i don't know and read those stories and try to relate with them and hope that like well this would really suck if that happened to me or to my friend or to my mother or i don't know yeah. and i think a key element is that it can't feel preachy it's something we talk a lot about with um with creative folks is how do you make this, I mean, and this is coming from a scripted angle, which is slightly different than journalistic angle, but like, how do you make this something that feels fun and, rele and relevant and not something where I'm trying to tell you that you should care about this? Because there's an allergic reaction to that, particularly in millennial audiences and younger, to be like, oh, you're trying to feed me something. You're trying to feed me a can of spinach and I'm not quite sure what that is and I feel uncomfortable about it. But it's like, what's the cotton candy that's wrapped around you know, the story that makes people go, oh, that's just really cool. I never thought about that. And the inception is that they're seeing different faces, they're seeing it from different perspectives, and suddenly that becomes a part of the way they think about the narrative. We do this with our engineers, so our engineers will actually advise on storylines. And so what's interesting is the group we put together just may not look like the stereotype. And so when the writers are working with them, suddenly the conversation becomes, oh, I know Jamie, I know Parisa, that's the character I'm thinking about. I'm not referencing off the stereotype. And then that little piece right there translates on screen and the audience then feels that same journey. And I think that's really the key, is that it's so much of this sometimes gets forced where people then shut down and we have to engage them and bring them in in a way that makes them feel excited because this is what it really is. It's about excitement. This is not a burden. This is an opportunity. This is a creative opportunity. And I think that's really, to me, the key switch. Yeah. Um, when we talk about diversity uh, and the media, you know, criticizes tech companies for not being diverse or lacking um, black engineers or Latino engineers, um, the media itself is, uh, has a long way to go to achieving parity, to achieving representation. Often people of color are a vast minority in their newsrooms, in their organizations, in writers' rooms. Mm -hmm. um, how does that play out in the coverage that happens? I mean, do you, what, is your, what are your thoughts on how the organization's own lacking of diversity or unconscious bias in the media affects the way that these issues are covered? Whew, uh, something, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, so TechCrunch recently came out with its diversity report, and um, I don't know, it, uh, <laughs> trying to choose my words very carefully right now, um, but, so not everyone participated in, in the survey, because, I mean, it, it wasn't a requirement, I think there were maybe, like, 70% participation, but, like, one, I'm, I don't know this for a fact, but my understanding is that 100% of the people of color participated in it, but not all of the white people. So it looks like <laughs> we're more diverse than we are. Uh, and um, so that was, I don't know, that was just interesting for me. And I mean, we're actually, TechCrunch is relatively diverse when it comes to gender and age and, Somewhat gender identity. Um, we have a, we have a good amount of queer folks on staff, um, but in terms of on the editorial team, the, the racial diversity is definitely still lacking. So, um, granted, I, I really enjoy covering diversity and inclusion. It's something I'm very passionate about. But um, a lot of times, if there's anything diversity related, it's like, oh, Megan, like do like do this and. Um, mm -hmm. And granted, at the same time, I said that I wanted to cover this, and I still want to. But 
And thankfully, there are people who like step up and do cover these issues. Like John Sheeper is great about that. Kate Conger is awesome. And um, so, like, there are other people. There are non-people of color who are talking about these issues. But I think, I think it's just really important that like everyone gets on board. Like, it can't just be like siloed and. Um, siloed off to like one person or a couple of people like it needs to be integrated into into the stories that don't even necessarily seem to have a diversity angle but like even if you're talking about like vr like i don't know like figure out like what effect it's going to have on the masses which means everyone which means low-income people are they going to be able to access virtual reality like what kind of experiences are they going to have and um and yeah now maybe i'm just going to get on to this tangent <laughs> but uh at the, I, I was able to attend the White House's South by South Lawn um, Festival, this like one day event um, last month, or I don't know what month it is anymore, it doesn't matter. But um, they had this really cool virtual reality experience that put you inside like of solitary confinement. And it was just like, it was in, it was like in partnership with like the Guardian and the Mill. And like, that was just such a, like a cool, use of technology for good and this and virtual reality for good because like a lot of times you you know hear about vr in the context of like palmer lucky and you're like Ugh. but um <laughs> there are other like there are really awesome ways that you could use vr and like so just looking at how it can um yeah affect people and everyone and yeah so i i think companies would like to hire more diverse people, more diverse media, but at the same time, they're having difficulty recruiting themselves, they're recruiting in, the, in their offices. And I think if they want to do a really good job, it's important that they do reach media that is diverse because you're going to report differently than someone who doesn't understand or care about diversity and that's the whole point of it. So if a company is trying to seek more diverse candidates, if it was me and I was a company, I would want to go to like a diverse ad agency who's careful with their messaging, who's careful with the fo photos and that they're real people, not actors, not someone who's in a wheelchair who can really walk. I mean, show the real photos. You know, at the same time, um, you know, besides the messaging, it, be real, be out there, look for them, hire them, give people a chance. And with media, that's the biggest problem. You don't see as much diversity in all the rooms. You go to a press event, there's hardly any diverse people. Why? Why not give it people the opportunity to do that? 100%. I couldn't agree more. And I think, if, I think if you look at the data, it's actually kind of freaky, the parallelism between multiple industries and representation, right? So you look at the number of, for example, cable showrunners uh, in television, um, and the numbers are fairly identical to our numbers in tech. Um, you look at background casts of women uh, in major motion pictures, the number is 17. That's the same number of CS grads in the United States, same number of representation within tech. Like, there's some really interesting parallelism in the data um, across multiple industries. I don't think we're having much of that conversation and how much all of that is influencing each other, right? So representation behind the camera is influencing what's happening on the camera, which then is influencing society to exactly. think that that underrepresentation is normal. It's like a feedback. So, then, so it's a feeder like, cycle, exactly. right? And I think we need to be talking about it more in that way, that these things are all interconnected. We don't live our lives in silos, so none of this exists in, in silos. And obviously, unconscious bias is a at the heart of that, right? Is most people are not malicious in not wanting to have representation on their staff. They often don't know how, they don't know what's happening, they don't know the slight cuts that are happening for some of their employees every day on the job. And one of my favorite examples is um, Glenn Mazzara, who show ran The Walking Dead uh, for two seasons and The Shield, and most recently Damien. Um, he's, you know, he self identifies as a middle aged, straight cis white man. And he says, Look, I was running my writer's room for The Shield. And the women were not speaking up in the room and I could not figure out why. So I went and talked to them and they said, watch, we get interrupted. And he was like, what are you talking about? And they were like, just watch. So the next day he watched the behavior of his writer's room and noticed they were right. They kept getting cut off and that his ear was subconsciously picking up the male voice more than the female voice. He noticed. And so what he did the next day is he said, new rule. From now on, nobody interrupts anybody in this room, period. 
He didn't highlight that it was women. He didn't. He just said nobody interrupts anybody. And what's interesting is that some of the men in his room came up to him afterward and said thank you because I was also getting interrupted. And the thing is, he hadn't even noticed because of the voice differentiation. He hadn't even picked up on some of the more introverted guys in his room were feeling shut down and they weren't vocalizing it. Right. So by making a new practice, he was able to make an inclusive environment for everybody. And now he's profitizing this across the entertainment industry. And I think it's people like him who sit in positions of power and who have influence and are at a certain point in their career in the media space saying. These are practical ways to move the needle and to start to change your environments and the way that you hire and the way you think about inclusion. Like that, to me, is like the gold, like nugget. If we can get a bunch of different people on that train, we're going to start pushing in the right direction. But like, it's going to take that kind of movement, and not just from us who are already bought in and care about it, but for those who have been in power, have held power for a while, and what are they doing about it, and how do they identify, right? And that, to me, I think is the Parallelism, and I think the opportunity from the sort of inclusion, unconscious bias standpoint. Absolutely. Um, I do want to get to audience questions. We have about 13 minutes left, so if anyone has any questions, I think there's some mics floating around. Yep. Thank you. This is a great panel. So, for a tech company looking to who is genuinely trying to improve in this area and would love to get press, what kind of stories are you looking for, or how could we pitch you? What kind of stories are we looking for, and how can they reach us? Um, I, I can start. I mean, at the Chronicle, we get pitched all the time. Um, email is often the most efficient way, and also the least efficient way, um, <laughs> because it'll get to us. But we, I mean, I, I don't know about. I can speak to everyone on this panel, but I get just a deluge of emails, and it can be hard to get through all of them. Um, I think the best advice I can give you is uh, be choosy. About the stories that you pitch, um, pick something that would be really unique or resonant or relevant in current events, and that's more likely to catch someone's attention. Yeah, I mean, yeah, what what you said. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, also, um, yeah, I guess just for for me, yeah, I mean, I yeah, I cover a lot about diversity and inclusion and uh, on-demand stuff, blah blah blah. But um, I think it. A lot of times, I'm I'm really interested in founder stories. Like, if the founder has a really cool story to tell or has had a unique experience, I might feel more inclined to write that story in, or just at least hear what they're what they're working on. Um, I'm really not into uh, most pitches that are about studies and. It's just I don't know. They're good for like reference, like in order to like reference for a larger story, but. Um, yeah, it, I don't know. It just depends. And it could even depend on how I'm feeling that day. And yeah, it's sorry, that's probably not helpful. <laughs> <laughs> I think email is the best way. And I don't like very long emails, maybe just short to the point and why you think we should feature this particular story or person. And for me, I love success stories. I love to hear about the underdog. I love to hear how you know, uh, someone came from nothing and is doing something pretty substantial. Someone who could be a role model. Someone that can relate to somebody else and say, hey, that's me, I could do that, or look at what they did. Those are the kind of stories we look for. Yeah. Yeah, I think people at the heart is always a good yeah. one. Uh, questions? Anybody? No other questions. Oh, one up here. Coming. Hi. Um, I'm really curious about when a lot of times in media stories about diversity in tech, uh, Asians are oft often not considered part of that. I'd love to hear what your perspective is on that. It's, I feel that there are many ways that it's connected, whether um, while there are many East Asian entrepreneurs and developers in the tech industry at the same time, the model minority um, stereotype really hurts Asians in tech and in the US as a whole. But I'd love to hear your perspective as media professionals um, on why that narrative might be. I couldn't hear a thing. She asked, uh, 
about the portrayal of East Asians in tech diversity coverage and how they often get lumped into the majority even though they are a racial ethnic minority and how we balance that. Anyone want to take that? Um, I can start. Um, it's, I think the problem is a lack of nuance when we talk about diversity and I think that that's true not just for East Asians but for any number of groups and unfortunately when these companies are breaking down their data, it's Latino, black, Asian, white, other. And it can be very, um, it erases a lot of the nuance in those categories. I also think, unfortunately, when we're talking about certain minorities, um, East Asians in particular, uh, are subject to this model minority myth, right? Where you are the good minority, where you have all these attributes that in some ways people just sort of see as part of this bigger story of tech and why it makes sense that you're there. And so I think that can play into it too. And that, again, might be part of this unconscious bias thing where if we don't have folks telling those stories who understand why that's a problem or why that's not true, it's very easy to get swept up in that. So that would be my thoughts. Um, I think how we solve that is just having these conversations and making people aware that um, that's a problem. Yeah, just to kind of piggyback on what you said. I mean, I think there there needs to be a, a greater push for for more information in within those diversity reports to really like break out yeah. um, to break out the the different races and ethnicities of everyone and not just really like lump them into a broader category. Um, and then also, I mean, just taking into account intersectionality, like that that also definitely plays plays a role, but like those stats aren't typically broken out in in diversity reports. So yeah, and then and then also of course, um, you know, if like your ability status, your physical ability, or if you're disabled, and um, I think that there needs to be more information around that as well. So there, yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of work to be done in in terms of what what companies are actually putting out and what they're looking at and the information that they're gathering. I was going to say, we're definitely very conscious of that in the initiative work that we're doing, um, mainly because, as we most probably all know in this room, that um, with the Oscar So White controversy, another piece that has come out of that is a deep conversation around the under, uh, underrepresentation of the Asian American community in all stripes. Um, and in some cases, an incredibly offensive portrayal sometimes, um, you know, and, and sort of whitewashing of that experience too. And um, I think something we're thinking about is strategy the sort of stereotype that's been associated, I think, with the profession itself. And I think white men and Asian men have generally been speaking, been portrayed in the stereotype. And how do we start to break down the sort of stereotypical characteristics that are around that? And then within that, then how do we explore more stories within the vast array of the Asian community? And it's something I think is really cool, is actually top of mind within the Hollywood industry because of amazing activism work uh, from different organizations, including CAPE and others uh, within the industry. Um, so my hope is out of that, we're going to start to see some really interesting choices coming up in terms of romantic male leads being Asian, which I think is something that's been woefully underrepresented. I think the idea of um, the Asian experience writ large being explored, where you're differentiating between being Indian, South Asian, right, so Filipino experience, Indonesian, right, versus, you know, Korean or Chinese. And I think the rise of China as a market is actually going to be tremendously helpful in that, um, mainly because where the money is, so goes everybody. And so how can we capitalize? I think the real question is, how can we capitalize from an activist community as well as from the tech community and other places to sort of intersect with that movement? Because I think that's going to be the real opportunity, right? Because if they're following the money to China, suddenly we have an opportunity to tell Chinese stories, but then that allows us to then start to get into, well, are we telling Korean stories, are we telling Indian stories, right, et cetera. So for me, that I think is going to start to unlock some really deep conversations around Asian representation. That's my theory. So I, I want to say that I apologize if that's how media relates to yeah. your community, because that is not something that I think any of us intend to do. And I think it's a perfect example of us having the lack of diversity in all realms. For example, I come from a Middle Eastern background. 
And so I see Middle Eastern women lumped also and spoken about in such the wrong ways because there are different women, different cultures within the Arab community and more Middle Eastern community. And I take offense to it, but you know, I look at it as lack of diversity, lack of understanding. And so if there were more on that team that were diverse, maybe someone from my background, her background, her background, a disabled person, that's why it's so important that whatever we do has to be a diverse round table because then we won't report incorrectly because when they do write it, it is looked upon and said, no, you're lumping them all together. You can't say it like that. That's not really how it is. And I think that's what the problem we find at schools, the problems we find in the boardroom. And I think you hit on something there, but I, I do want to apologize if that's how it seems. And I will, and I know we will look at that a bit more. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I think we have a question in the front row. Oh, over there, okay. Hi. You're next. Yeah. Okay, so thanks so much for this. This has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Um, I'm from Atlanta, and one of the things that I'm noticing in Atlanta in particular is that we're dealing with um, a lack of collaboration from industries being siloed and not tackling community-wide issues. What I'd like to understand is it seems like in the entertainment industry, diversity is the number one conversation in tech. Diversity is the number one conversation in so many different realms, especially in the advertising industry. Diversity is the number one conversation. What do you guys see, or do you even see that there's an opportunity for collaboration for the, for the tech industry to partner with the advertising industry and the entertainment industry because they are such loud voices and large, such large platforms to really tackle some of these issues? Can you repeat the question? Uh, she wanted to know if there's an opportunity for cross-industry collaboration because there's similar issues with diversity in, uh, I think she said, advertising, tech, and entertainment. Yep. I, I mean, I think absolutely, uh, 100%. Um, something we're seeing in our work is that there seems to be, because advertisers are craving content that reaches very deep and specific demographics, right? That's where the money is coming from. We have online platforms, many of them owned by tech companies, including our own YouTube, that reach very specific, deep audiences through the content. And so how can we essentially feed the advertisers with the content that's produced by folks of all stripes, right? And suddenly you're raising income coming in for both the creators and the company as well as the advertisers. So yes, I think that's the recipe right there. And it really clearly links a tech company with entertainment objectives and advertisers, right? Um, and so that through line equation, 100%, something we're talking about um, as a company, but also I think pretty much every online digital platform is talking about because as you've probably, it's true, as you've probably seen, the reflection of what's happened in traditional media is, has happened on digital media as well. I mean, I think unconscious bias just reigns supreme all the time. And so this advertising opportunity is the one where we can combat it actively. Um, so I'm so glad you brought that up because, again, where the money is, the rest follows. And so, um, I mean, that's the recipe right there, I think. Yeah, 100%. I think the challenge though, in, in, at least when we're talking about the media, is entertainment can very easily partner with ad firms, can very easily partner with tech companies. Journalism organizations, news organizations are less likely to do so because there's a pretty hard line, and this is how it's always been, between the newsroom and the ads. And so it's a very hard thing to cross, and a lot of that has to do with you know, editorial independence and not wanting to muddle your coverage, so I think that challenge is it particularly interesting with journalism because there are these very hard walls up. For our magazines, it's imperative to have the editorial with the advertising because the image that you get from the ad isn't always what the company is really trying to portray. So if you have an ad that is very diverse, that is having a message, but to have an advertorial at the same time really gets the message where it could be something like maybe um, a veteran who just got discharged, who went through a transition, who's now working for, let's say, Amazon, and how he's climbing the corporate ladder, and it actually tells a story. It's not selling the company, it's telling his story so that if another veteran reads it, 
can say, you know, that could be me. I've never thought about applying there. Maybe I'll go there. So I think a lot of times having advertising and editorial hand in hand really works because there's always misconceptions in an ad. Okay. All right. So my question is about uh, one of the things I'm not hearing mentioned is how do you how do you reach out to the more rural physical communities so that have traditionally been passed over by tech, by you know, a lot of the more innovations recently that have been more focused on cities. You know, how do you get you know, someone who's a farmer, someone who's a hunter feeling like, oh, I can be part of that too. Like the advertisement of you know, a woman going hunting after finishing up a coding project, something like that. Sure. Um, I think part of that just has to do with how we think about tech. Um, and I think it is moving in the direction of thinking about tech and blank and the intersections of things. Um, I've done some stories about tech and agriculture, uh, farmers using drones, um, how kind of the money in California is affecting um, some of these rural communities. Um, but I think because, yeah, tech companies are centered in cities and people who work for tech companies are centered in cities, that's the focus. Um, but I think as we kind of get away from just writing about tech as a monolith and start looking at tech as something that involves every part of our lives, we're going to start to see more of that. And, and I think it's interesting because I think inclusion then automatically plays a part in that equation, right? Because suddenly the farmers you covered, mostly Latino, yeah. right? So suddenly they're using technology in the profession in which they exist in that particular area of the country, right? And so suddenly, this raises the profile in some ways, right? Because tech is, I think, often viewed as sort of sexy, cool, like on the edge, right? And maybe agriculture, I think stereotypically, may not be thought of in the same way. Right. And so suddenly by merging the two, you're giving credence to agriculture in a completely different way, and then you're elevating that community along with the story, right? They are tech entrepreneurs. Like, what does a tech entrepreneur look like? And suddenly, if you're talking about agriculture, well, it looks like a farmer. Like, what? And so I think that, that could, to that decoupling, I think then to the local level could be really cool when you think about cities that are around certain industries, right? Or around certain professions that may not be thought of in that way as part of the technical landscape. And suddenly you elevate that profile by the combination, that sort of and question. You know? I also think to some degree it might happen naturally as we start grappling with issues of climate change, mm -hmm. of drought, of things that are going to require um, farming communities and agriculture to innovate in new ways. And I think that that's, especially in California, been a big focus of a lot of the coverage I've seen about agriculture and tech has been, you know, how are farmers innovating to deal with a lack of water resource? How are these communities um, bridging the digital divide so that uh, the children, perhaps, of farm laborers who are Latino, who speak Spanish, um, can learn to use technology in ways that their parents couldn't. And, I, I would totally agree that it has to do also with diversity of uh, journalism organizations. I've done a lot of uh, coverage of ag communities because I speak Spanish and um, not everyone can make inroads into those communities because they have a language barrier. So, any other questions? If you could repeat the question when they do, I can't hear a thing oh, sure, when they yeah. do. I've Thank you. To do that, so. Okay, I know you, you've been great. Thank you. Hello, uh, this has been a really awesome panel, um, so thank you all very much. Um, my question is in regard to myself as a consumer. Um, I want to know what are ways that I can help um, push some of the mainstream media that already has the, um, the following that they need to reach a very wide audience. Um, aside from investing, you know, myself in you and following your, um, you know, your stories that cover inclusion and telling people that they should listen to, you know, This Week in Blackness instead of getting their, um, you know, news from the local news station or whatever. But how can I put pressure on, you know, the New York Times and the Washington Post and, you know, these kinds of um, places that are, they have such a wide audience and they have so much influence in such a large way and they're not pushing the boundaries and um, kind of moving in that direction of covering inclusion and being a little bit more educated about that stuff. So the question was, uh, how can consumers 
push mainstream media organizations to do more uh, inclusive work and coverage? Um, what, what power does she as a consumer have? Um, I mean, Twitter is huge for, um, for, that, um, for that sort of communication with companies. I mean, if you, you know, even just mention them in a comment, I mean, that could be a start. And then getting the right people to retweet that. Um, yeah, I'm not, in terms of like mainstream media, and if we're talking like New York Times and Washington Post, I mean, I, I think maybe they have some, some coverage here or there, but um, yeah, it's, I guess it's not really too much into the nitty gritty of, of what's going on like day to day around diversity and inclusion in the tech industry. Um, I'm just thinking like, I know like Mike Isaac did something on Project Include when that came out. Um, but yeah, I guess, yeah, Twitter. <laughs> I mean, sure. I would argue that uh, sharing stories and content from al alternative sources is what you can do. I mean, it may not get CNN to cover what we're writing about, but it will get other issues and other stories in front of your friends and your acquaintances and people who follow you. And, I think that with the rise of social media, the way people consume news has changed so much that they're not just going to one place. And so if you feel that it's important to have a diversity of perspectives, then seek that out and put it in front of the people in your own network. Because if we don't actively do that, I mean, we're all being pushed into these echo chambers where we're not getting a diversity of opinion. Yeah, my advice to you would be do anything, anything, but don't do nothing, okay? whatever you do, whether it's social media, writing, an email, whatever it is, make the complaint, say something about it, give your opinion, because it counts. All right, I think 100%. we're out of time, folks, but thank you so much. Those were great questions. And thank you. Thank Have you. Fun. It was fun. Yeah.